is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Wes Jankowski and Rob Thorup of MyPracticeMyBusiness.com and CEODentist.com. So, so you, uh, so um, you guys are together, but it's two different websites. Wes Jankowski's with CEODentist.com, and Rob Thorup is a dentist with MyPracticeMyBusiness.com. So, I guess we should start off as uh, explain <laughs> those two two different websites. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and give it a shot here. Rob and I have actually, CEO Dentist is my company. We're a practice management company uh, out of Denver, Colorado. And Rob and I actually met and became business partners about 12 years ago. I was working for a large national firm at the time. And uh, I had come into the practice management space as a business guy. I didn't have a dental background. I didn't have you know, the language. I didn't understand the procedures. Actually, at the time, I hadn't even bought my own teeth yet, so I had a lousy smile, but I understood business. And so I was invited to go to a program that Rob was presenting uh, in Utah. And I was just, you know, I'm a, I spent a lot of time with a company that uh, did work with uh, Tony Robbins. So I learned that, how to that's model. For, that's and I uh, started this. T- Tony Correct. Robbins is Correct. fortune manager. I spent my first five years as a coach uh, and learning from some of the best coaches out there. The folks from Fortune are fantastic. And I own franchises with them. And uh, uh, then about 2006, went off on my own. We just have difference of uh, opinion. On, they, they are in a lot of spaces. And I stayed in just dental. But uh, going back to the conversation about Rob is that Rob and I met in, uh, uh, in Utah. He was doing a presentation out, out there. Uh, my experience of coming into the dental space was is that the dentist, I was walking in there and I was a business guy. I wasn't, I, I didn't have that clinical background. So I'd walk in there and started talking business on how to have them grow their business. You know, we always got phone calls because profitability was low. Uh, they wanted to grow their practice. They wanted more procedures. They wanted to make more money in addition to the care they were given. And so I thought being a business guy would be a great place to be. And I found out it was very difficult to communicate with people who don't know business and then try to teach them business. Well, I went out there and met Rob. Rob's standing in the front of the room and he's giving an education and he's a dentist and he's giving it like a business person. And we immediately hit it off. I stayed in contact with him for years. He's now on our advisory board. He and a couple other dentists that are old clients of mine that have retired now. And uh, they've helped us build the kind of the uh, bridge between the clinical side and the business side. And that's what CS, uh, CS, excuse me, CEO Dennis does. And Rob, again, is, uh, you know, he trains with us and uh, helps us coach practices. And uh, he's got his own firm. So in addition to the dentistry that he does, he owns his own company, too. And we, we actually promote his products and services. All right, Rob, what's, what's my practice, my business.com? So my practice, my business is a company that has uh, two web-based softwares. Um, we have My Dental Stats, which is a statistical dashboard, and a and then My Dental Docs, which is a document center that helps uh, augment treatment planners, and it teaches the why uh, to patients why they need treatment, helps them uh, understand. Uh, why they need the treatment so they can go home and explain it to their spouses, uh, roommates, whoever it is that they're with and uh, and they can make financial decisions together instead of uh, instead of trying to just take a treatment planner home and not understand a thing that the dentist has said and of course patients forget 85 percent of what you tell them right when they walk out the door anyway and then we have uh, we train in clinical business Howard we West teaches practices the business aspects of their of their dental practice we teach the clinical side when it comes to uh, procedures and codes and helping them differentiate products and services and helping them understand uh, how to deal with insurances and then those products that we've created and the training that we've created uh, backs up and helps them uh, with the things that our company does for them so Rob you got out of school in uh, 89 and uh, Wes, you uh, you said you've been in the dental space how long? Sixteen years. So, so the the um, I, I think the big macroeconomic problem is that in two thousand five, dentist income peaked at um, something like uh, um, what what oh well, off the top of my head, um, what was it two twenty or yeah, you know, was it two twenty four? 
and now it's down to 174. Uh, no, it's dropped. It's dropped uh, thirty eight thousand uh, dollars net income in the last decade. Uh, yeah. I think it was two fourteen to one seventy four. But anyway, they're basically losing thirty eight hundred dollars a year, and that that number comes from uh, Marco, which is the uh, chief economist with a PhD at the American Dental Association. Because every so we're all basically the same age, and you know. 30 years ago, you just submitted your fee and they paid a percent. Now it's all switched right. over to PPO. So instead of everybody submitting their fee and the insurance paying a percent, they lowered the fees 40%, send us the fee, and now 82 out of 100 dentists are on PPOs. And the million dollar question is, they, they, they keep buying all this fancy technology and they have right. this mindset of a dental office from the 70s and the 80s as high end um, stuff and they're buying all this fancy high tech, but their fees are down 40%. And they give their staff another dollar an hour every time the earth goes around the sun because obviously raises should be based on astrology and where the planet is. And so how do you, how do you tackle these issues of decreasing <laughs> fees, increasing PPOs and labor costs that are out of control? Well, Howard, I'll tell you, can I answer that Wes? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, well, so if anybody who does a study on which states are inundated with PPOs, you know that Utah's either ranks number one or number two uh, with, the, with the worst <laughs> amount of PPO plans that we have. Not to be knocking insurances, I'll say right now, if it wasn't for insurances, patients probably, the psychology behind it, they wouldn't come in for the regular recare appointments. They probably wouldn't even come in for comprehensive exams and, and start that oral help will spinning. So I am grateful for them in that aspect. But over 20 years ago, I was using a lab that created a crown called the Procera Elite Crown. And I worked closely with the owner of that lab. And, and uh, <clears throat> those crowns, though, were way more expensive, Howard, than the typical crowns, PFMs or, or IPS Empress crowns that I was getting out of a guy's uh, uh, basement because we have a million lab techs here in Utah also. So I, I had a patient come in, uh, and, and she was a 17-year-old female high school cheerleader, the prom queen in two and a half weeks, and she came into my office with her parents, and she was in tears. She had a swimming pool accident, and the swimming pool won and fractured <laughs> off eight and nine, and I looked at that and I said, there is no way composites are going to work on, on those teeth. We need to do some all porcelain restorations on those. And I didn't want to do the typical ones we had out there. I was watching these Pro Serie Elite crowns um, from our good friend uh, uh, south of where I'm at, uh, Dick Barnes at the time. And he, they created a, a crown that really looked lifelike. And it was just layering clear occlusal uh, porcelain on the crowns and made it look really good. And so I... I, they were about 200 bucks each, and I told the parents, gosh, I really want to use these crowns, but they're more expensive, and I'm not sure if your insurance company will allow me to even use them, with, and, but I, I would need to charge you more for them, and so I said, let me call the insurance company and ask them, and this was back when the PPOs were just starting to become inundated in Utah, and all the rules and, and things varied, you know, they, they were pretty common with all the PPO plans, but some of them varied a little bit, so I called them. And uh, it was Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I talked to a lady named Mary. And I, and I got to her after I got through the first wall of, look, I want to use these crowns. They're more expensive. Can I charge a patient more to use these crowns? Not adding to the D2740 all porcelain crown code. I want to be able to just charge them a fee. <clears throat> and they said, well, is that a lab fee? And I said, well, it's more like a cosmetic fee, you know, or a, a materials fee, I said. And so they said, I'm not sure. Let me put you through to Mary. So Mary gets on the phone and she says, Dr. Thorpe, I understand your situation. And she said, if you'd actually read your contract, you would know the answer to this question. And I said, well, what's the answer? <laughs> and I said, I don't read contracts. That's what office managers do. I just do dentistry. And she said, well, if you provide a service or, or a procedure that we don't cover, you can provide it based on a fee-for-service fee. And I said, yeah, but you guys do cover D2740, all porcelain crowns. And she said, yes, we do. But what you're talking about is called a cosmetic upgrade. That's what we have in our books. And I said, cosmetic upgrade? I said, well, um, so what does that mean? And she, I said, what do I charge for it? And she said, 
whatever the market will bear. And, I, and I'm like, okay, what does that term mean? And she said, well, there's a, a price point where you might get too high and the patient will go away. She goes, we call that a tipping point. And I said, well, typically crowns will cost me about $80 for my lab. This $120 more. I said, should I just charge $120? And, and she goes, I'm not telling you what to charge, but don't leave money on the table. So I, end, I thought about it and I thought, gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try 225 per crown, see what happens. So I went out and told the, the, and she told me that I had to have the patient sign in the chart that the insurance company was not responsible for the additional fee. And so I had the patient sign in the chart, not responsible for the additional fee. It did not fall under the D2740 code. And, it, and where we placed it years ago was in the 2999 unspecified restorative procedure by report code. And I owe my life to this lady named Mary at Blue Cross Blue Shield because when I asked her that question, she taught me, you know, a business terminology that I'd never heard before. And of course, my dad, bless his heart, he taught me a lot about business. And I worked at his battery company from the time I was nine on. And so I said, I started thinking really fast in my mind. I said, well, Mary, not all composites are created equal to. Um, can I differentiate those and charge the patient an additional fee for a more expensive composite? And she said, go read your contract. The answer is yes, but you need to, you dentists just don't know business. And I said, well, Mary, we're analytical. If it's not spelled out in black and white, we don't get it. And so... From that point on, I realized, wow, I went and read every contract. We actually found some insurances that said that we could charge additional uh, fees on crowns that were more expensive. And, and Howard, you and I know, and Wes does now too, you, when you're talking about a crown offshore, you can get a crown at $65 or you can use some of the high-end uh, labs and buy a crown for $480, the same type of crown. And where there's that big differential, in cost of goods, how do we, how do we justify when we're locked in with the PPO plan? And the answer is simple: communicate with the insurance companies. Oh my goodness, you won't get in trouble by communicating. Our good friend Charles Blair wrote an article in January, kind of discussed this uh, idea. Finally, he he, I'm glad he wrote this article. He and I met about five years ago, and I described that to him. And he wrote an article on, on, geez, yeah, maybe we should be calling the insurance companies and, and, and asking them if we can provide better products and services. Because, Howard, here's the simple truth. No business that I know of in the United States has the same price point when there's a differential in cost of goods. And if you can tell me one, man, I want to write them down because they're, they've got to be few and far between. But dentistry, we're inundated with that. We will have composites at $32 a gram versus $11 a gram, yet we have the same price point based on surfaces. Crowns, all porcelain crowns, I already explained that one. What about, what about uh, implants? You can buy an implant from Implant Direct for just over $100, but then you can get the really, you know, BioHorizons out there is touting they're the top dog now, and they're about $325, and Nobel BioCare, they're the same price up there too. So, how can we put our business hats on and stop taking it, uh, you know, giving our services away or decreasing our profitability when we use these higher end materials? And I'm telling you right now, it's by giving the patient choice and empowering the patient with choice, letting them make that choice and then charging accordingly and, and not increasing the existing contracted codes we have. But understanding and having that communication with the insurance companies by providing a value-added service to our patients. And you don't just do it with insurance companies, though, Howard. You've got to do it with your insured and fee-for-service patients. You cannot discriminate. It has to be done across the board. And that's a business concept that most dentists just don't understand, that it's done across the board. But that's where Wes and I, we train the offices and how to do that. And it's simple, though. I mean, I learned that from Gordon Christensen on, on doing uh, uh, bone augmentations on extractions uh, umpteen years ago. I got that concept uh, uh, from him, got it from Blue Cross. It's all made sense to me because we can't go buy, we can't buy filet mignon at hamburger price, can we? We can't buy pre premium gasoline at regular gas price. Why dentistry? Howard, you and I have been doing this about the same amount of time. Who taught us that? Where did that, that 
mindset come in at that we can only do what we think we can only do? How can we expand that, that, uh, that, that business mindset that's out there? I've seen like the Pink Institute and some of the other institutes teach that concept, but they still don't, they still don't give the dentist the right tools to do it the right way. But, I, but they have that concept down. Wes, you got anything to add to that? Well, you know, what we do in the field is that however the rumor got started, the insurance companies actually perpetuate that conversation today. There wasn't just a few months ago where I was in a dental office and um, the insurance company was on the telephone call and I was invited to the call. And we asked a lot of same questions, you know, as far as uh, differentiating services and things. And we talked about cosmetic upgrades. And the people on the telephone, you know, again, I, do, I don't think it's any, there's no one trying to get the dentist. I just don't think they understand what we're trying to accomplish. And sometimes we don't ask the right questions. Right. So when, when we're asking those questions of the, uh, of the insurance representatives, the sales representatives, as well as the people on the telephones, we need to be able to communicate in their language, get, off, get out of the clinical side, not talk about parts and pieces, talk more of a business conversation where we can figure out exactly what will work with that insurance company. Again, the language in the, in the contract is important, understanding the, uh, how to play by the rules with them. So when we are taking this concept to market and working with the dental offices, they are already, I don't I want to call it a fear factor because I don't think dentists are fearful, but at the same time, they feel like they're strapped by the insurance company, just haven't been trained another way. So sitting down with them, and I'll, I'll give you a prop here, Howard, about three, four years ago, you and I were on a phone call, and you made a comment uh, that kind of shifted our company a bit. You had made a comment that said, Wes, nobody wants you for your new ideas. They pay you for implementation. And so we started sitting down with our clients and actually showing them, here's, here's how to present the treatment properly to the patient. Here's the types of tools you would need so a patient would understand the difference. And they can go home again, talk to potentially the financial person at home so they can jointly make the decision. Uh, how do you do this? Um, uh, how do you communicate the, not the clinical, not just the, uh, you can't do it based on uh, the brand names and things. It's got to be something that actually differentiates one product from another. Um, the doctors feel like they're selling. We have to teach them that they technically they are in sales, but how can I have you present this treatment and feel good on a daily basis that you're not hard selling, you're not trying to push a patient in one direction or another, you're just taking care of your business. And most of them don't know, uh, again, I'm, I'm talking to the choir, you, you both are business people, so you understand this, but you know, I walk into dental, dental offices and the doctors don't know their direct operating costs. They don't know their cost of goods. Um, they feel like they're losing money on certain transactions, but they don't know it. So when you lay all this down on, on paper and you actually show them how it affects their bottom line and how this strategy by playing by the rules so you're not getting in trouble with the insurance companies, you're treating everyone fairly, but you're offering patients the opportunity um, to have the choices and they make the choices and so you don't have to force something on them. They love it. And that with a little bit of practice to become very, very good at it. And it just, you know, when you made the comment about losing $3,800 a year, um, Dr. Rob and I were actually on the telephone just before we got on here. Uh, he's taken a little bit of time off and he's already made his nut for the month. And a lot of that, I asked him, I said, you know, today's dollars, how much of today's revenues came from those upgrades? And it was approximately 23%. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it's not about going out having more patients. It's not about working more hours. It's actually working with a business strategy and, and doing the right things from a business perspective. And you can win the game that way. I think uh, private practice is alive and well in this country. And there will be a place for all the different strategies. Uh, but I think that the private practice dentists are going to really have to get on, on board with uh, some business strategies. And that's why the, the name CEO Dentist, we want to get them into that kind of a business mentality. So, Howard, here's an interesting thing that I noticed. Uh, my wife went into, what, into the Aveda world, and I don't know if you ever heard of that term. Most women and, and many men buy Aveda products, and they go to hair salons, and they and my goodness gracious, first of all, I never want to hear somebody can't afford dentistry because when we see how much is spent on, on those, uh, in, in those businesses, it, it's like oral health care is way more critical in our view, obviously, than the outward uh, appearance. But man, those, 
those clients, they spend a lot of money, but they're given options. They're always given options. It's called the trading up phenomenon. It's existed forever. Uh, there's a book, I think, Howard Schultz of Starbucks, Leslie Wexner of Limited Brands. They wrote some book called Trading Up, and, and, and trading up exists in both good and bad economies. That's what in the book I remember reading about that years ago. And it's, it's just differentiating products and services. And, and given the patient choice, when you empower a patient with choice, nine times out of 10, they're going to take that better choice. They'll trade up in areas that are, are emotionally meaningful to them, that, has, that is connected to the, what we call the, the neocortex of the brain, the why they want this stuff. It's important to them emotionally. And they trade down in other areas, like they maybe they, you know, won't feed their kids for a week or something like that, so they can afford to to buy that thing that's emotionally meaningful to them. Well, in dentistry, it's, what's really interesting to me is, is when doctors first hear this concept about trading up or upgrading, they're like, oh, I I don't know about that. But let's look at whitening. How many years is has whitening? Uh, we've had two codes, uh, one for the upper arch, one for the lower arch. And we never had uh, in-office whitening. We still really don't have a differential of codes there. And yet doctors right now are charging way more for in-office whitening than they are for, for tray whitening. And insurances are starting to regulate what we can charge for whitening teeth with trays. That's what we're starting to see out here in Utah. We've got a handful of insurances that are now setting those codes and those fees. And yet in office whitening would is, is something that you know it's it's whitening right but it's done in office so we charge way more for it so that that would be an example of where dentists are already upgrading and they don't even know it and if they actually have conversations howard with insurance companies which i have done i've called every insurance company i take and i have this conversation with them and some of them are starting to do a little pushback on it saying well we want you to put the very best material in and we want you to pay for it doc it should come out of your pocket to pay for our clients' dental work. And, I mean, they literally have, – we have these conversations with them all the time. But I just had a conversation with uh, two uh, high-end people in one of the major dental insurance companies, and they're using this word disallow now. They disallow this. They disallow that. And I asked them the question, what do you want in your mouth? I would never put anything substandard in your mouth. So if you choose uh, product A – which is not a, an upgraded material. I would never put that in your mouth, but I'm certainly not going to put the very the most expensive thing in your mouth. But if you want product B, it's your choice, and, and it's X amount of dollars more. And, of course, they say to me every single time without fail, well, yeah, I want the better material. Well, then don't you think you should be responsible for it? Because we can't pay for it. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, that is a good point. And this was great. Then they said, Dr. Thorup, we need more people like you on our board that we can communicate these things with so that we can try and see if we can cover these things. Well, I don't want them covering these things because that's where our profit centers are. That's where we can, we can when we take a 40% hit in a PPO fee, we can at least try to capture 15, 20% back if a patient chooses a better product or service that we provide for them. And, and again, I, I, I ask the question, you know, to dentists all the time, what's your direct operating cost per hour? How long does it take you to provide that procedure? Are you truly in the black or are you in the red? And when I start opening up their minds and, and they, they actually do a direct operating cost per hour, I used, to, I used to fly, I was a corporate pilot for a while, and I'll tell you, uh, Beechcraft, Cessna, uh, uh, Salt Falcon, all of them, through Conklin and company, they know the exact operating cost per hour of those planes down to the penny. And we need to think like that in dentistry because that's how our fees really should be set, is what does it cost for us to produce that, that service that, and, and with that product? We need to know the cost of the products we're using. We need to know our direct operating cost per hour so we can make business decisions on what we do insurance plans that we take, and maybe the renegotiating of reimbursement rates from those insurance companies. Because we all know that they have multiple reimbursement rates, not just one. And those are things that, that I hope dentists start looking into off with what they learned from us here today. 
to start seeing opportunity instead of instead of seeing you know brick walls to run up against because you mm -hmm. can't be profitable in today's age with taking PPO plans and you have to remember the insurance companies there they're make they want to make a profit based upon what they provide as a service and we want to make a profit too but sometimes I'll say all the time it should fall back on to the consumer the patient whether they want product A or product B I've talked to the uh, many higher ups in Patterson and Henry Schein and I asked them what are the trends of dentists in buying products are they buying the high end stuff middle grade or low end and always they're buying the low end but the dentists who have like this conscientious uh, decision to make they'll buy the middle grade products so they can sleep at night but very 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 few are buying the high end products to provide to their patients especially when they're on PPO plans and that's well, you know so so much of it is uh, our thinking is cultural. Like very very few countries does someone else pay for your dentistry. Um, you know, like uh, the United States, England, Japan. There's no such thing as dental insurance in Singapore or China or India or Brazil. And when you talk to them about dental insurance, they they don't even get it. Why would anybody else pay for you, who's drinking Coca Cola and not brushing and flossing your teeth? In fact, they think it's a perverse incentive. They say that the government in America is subsidizing decay because they're subsidizing to treat the decay. And, uh -huh. um, and a lot of it's culture, too. Like, even within the United States, like in Phoenix, Arizona, every Chinese restaurant in Phoenix will deliver to my house, and not a single Mexican one will. Um, you know, they both, they all have cars, but it's just a culture thing. So uh -huh. Chinese people just think, <laughs> we deliver. And Mexican people think, no, you'll come and get it. And, and, you know, it's, so it's just cold. There's, there's no right or wrong. It's just so much culture. By the way, uh, I was born where all those planes were made in Wichita, Kansas. I mean, all those Cessnas, Beach. When I was growing up, it was a different time. I was born in 62. And when I was growing up, it, like, it seemed like every week on the evening news, there'd be a wheat field with smoke coming out where some test pilots <laughs> went down. And we used to, used to never have a bad day when you just think. And, and everybody in the room would always say, man, those poor test pilots. Because... They made more planes per year in Wichita because they made all the small planes. You know, big Boeing in Seattle, those big planes they only roll one off every once in a while. But in Wichita, you had Cessna and Boeing and Beach and Gates and all, all these deals. And back then, man, oh, my God, I, I, I can remember 100 pictures. But you, you said your dad owned a battery company. What, what kind of batteries? Like, like little AA well, batteries? Uh, so he was a distributor uh – for Gould and, and uh, Battery back in the day, and, and then, uh, of course, many other companies came in. And that was my whole point. I used to sell, we sold car batteries and diesel batteries and heavy, you know, big machinery that we have out here at Kennecott Mine, and all the way down to motorcycle batteries. But the point is that I learned from him is you could buy a two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year battery, and the, and the differential in the batteries was the thicknesses of the plates and the amount of punch they packed. That's what differentiated two, three, and four and five year batteries and they they weren't all the same price my goodness you know and and so here we are in dentistry that's that's why it, it when I started practicing I'm going and, and technology technology is the problem and the solution <laughs> it started to grow and we started to see all these different materials you know from you know lithium to silica to zirconia you know as we've seen through the years and we've seen the composites go from large particle sizes and bis GMA to all same golf ball size particles. I mean, who, who sits there at some drawing board and thinks that thing, stuff up? But we're grateful to those engineers that produce that stuff because it benefits our patients. But it's like there's a differential in cost of goods for batteries. And I'm going, Mike, I, I can buy composite $11 a gram from, from Henry Schein with their natural elegance. And I can buy Voco's uh, new composite or, or Filtech Supreme. And they're over $30 a gram. And I'm, I'm going, why in the world is there one price point? This makes no sense, no business sense at all. And I think, oft, I think oftentimes, Howard, we're taken advantage of, especially here in Utah. We are taken advantage of by the industry, the insurance industry, because they know we don't know business. In fact, when I talk to insurance uh, personnel managers, they make the comment, you know, dentists just don't understand business. And I think if we understood business better, uh, when you were in dental school, I went to UOP and we had six hours of business training. 
not six semester hours, six hours over a week at lunchtime. <laughs> we had to go eat our lunch while somebody came and talked, a guy like Wes came and talked to us about business, the business aspect of dentistry. And so I, I, it was a, it's phenomenal to me that so many dentists are, they, they need to take that time and the training and, and read all they can and, and listen to podcasts like you have. I mean, there's so many sources out there, you and others, that, that really do help us with the business of dentistry. And, and, and by understanding uh, product differentiation and understanding how to really truly look at your direct operating costs and cost of goods and setting fees based upon those numbers, not because Henry Schein did a DPAT or you subscribe to some national fee bank to show where your fees are in your geographical area. No, you need to actually put a business hat on and really understand why you need to set your fees where you do based upon the amount of time it takes you to produce that procedure and get it done. So that's where the battery industry came in. and That's where uh, grateful to my dad to start, you know, I don't think child labor laws existed back in the Oh, I know. Me right. and my five sisters were working in my dad's restaurant all full time by age 10. Evenings, Saturdays, <laughs> weekends. And that's why I'm so against the minimum wage law. I think it's criminal because, um, you know, if your dad owns a restaurant like my dad did, me and my five sisters are in there, we're making money, we're seeing mentors, we're, we're seeing business, and it was just a blast. But if your dad doesn't own a business and you have to wait till you're 16, you're just sitting there twirling your thumbs, you're bored. Uh, and uh, if McDonald's wants to hire a 12 year old and pay him two bucks an hour, that's the, that's the 12 year olds going to heaven. The fact that on Saturdays and Sundays, he gets to go work at McDonald's for two bucks an hour. I think, I think it's criminal, but batteries uh, bring up a cultural question. Like, like I said, all the Mexican restaurants won't deliver all Chinese do. Why is that? I like go to the grocery store. All the batteries are shrink wrapped. I mean, you could throw them out of an airplane and they'd work, but the eggs are in a flimsy carton. I'm, I'm always looking at my eggs and batteries like, shouldn't this be reverse packaging? I mean, why, am I, why is my egg carton uh, collapsing and breaking and my, my AA batteries, I could throw them across an interstate? So um, I, I want to ask you, when, when you're talking about technology, you know, upgrading, you were talking about clinical dentistry, Procera crowns, Procera Elite crowns, whatever. Um, what about all this expensive technology? I mean, the, the, the fees are come, the PPO fees have dropped 40%. But it seems like, like right now we're talking uh, Zero World's going on. And, I mean, there's just some big, sexy, expensive equipment. I mean, $150,000 Serac machines, $100,000 Galileos and CBCT machines and lasers and all that. So how do you, how do you rectify uh, my fees are down 40%, switching from indemnity to PPO, um, and the technology um, is wow and uh, expensive. And my staff wants a raise every time the earth goes around the sun and plasts Uranus, you know. <laughs> so so I, I used to, I put myself through school as an EMT. And, uh, Damn, you're a man of many ads, a pilot, an EMT, a dentist, a CEO. <laughs> hey, life is too short. You know, you've got to experience everything in life. And uh, I won't you're, even you're get into You're from it. Utah, so you could probably add uh, elk hunting or deer hunting. One of those two, I bet's in there. With a bow. With a bow. Don't really, use a gun. A, yeah, you're a bow elk or deer? I, I used to be an avid bow hunter for anything. Anything. Any animal that moved, I would get a license for and go get it. But uh, now I just fly fish. That's all I do, and I catch and release them. <laughs> so, except I'll eat one or two here and there. But I, Utah Valley Regional Medical Center, I'll never forget, they got the first uh, uh, CAT scan in the state of Utah. And that machine cost a million dollars. And my question to them was, who pays for that? How much does it cost for a CAT scan? And they said, well, the fee is X, but we're making the community pay for it because we're tagging on a couple of dollars on every single bill that comes, every single patient that comes through here gets a couple of dollar bill tagged to them. And uh, so the whole community is paying for it because the whole community benefits. And I, I've thought about that many times. And although I would never have my other patients pay for technology, but I have a CAD cam in my office and I love it. And you know, when, and so we have a CAD cam fee that we attach, we multi-code and attach to every crown we do. So my patients have the choice of two different all porcelain crowns and if they choose uh, the, the better product and, and want that crown plus the same day, uh, 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 benefit of having that crown done in the same appointment. I hate same day because it's really same appointment. 
if you're taking all day to make that crown, you probably should just go back to a lab. But in two, two hours time, that crown is, is cut, made, and cemented. And, uh, and we charge a fee for that, for that patient experience. And patients are happy to pay for that fee. We don't charge enough. So we, you charge a separate fee separate, for a the separate, crown? With, with a created code. Now, we could put it under the 2999 or 9999 code, right? But, you know, insurances don't pay for that, for that code anyway. So what's the point in uh, having that? So that's, with, what you're, so that's what you're doing, basically. You're, so it sounds like what you're, you're mastering is reading each PPO contract, looking for uh, game theory, how you can optimize this, looking for codes so that you're actually billing more per hour. Exactly. You, thanks for summarizing this whole conversation. That is exactly what you do. You look and read the contract, and you'll read a contract where it will not come out and say, sure, you can provide a, any service or product you provide that we don't cover is based on a fee-for-service basis. Many of the insurances I take don't say that, but the, all of them, not one of them says that I cannot do it. Not one says that I cannot upgrade a patient I can't provide a value-added service between me and the doctor. And Howard, let me go as far as to say this. No insurance company has the right to come between the doctor-patient relationship and to start dictating how we provide dentistry. So, uh, so how, how, long how, have you, how long have you been doing this on your website, mypracticemybusiness.com? So how long, have I been, how long have I been doing this type of protocol in my office? Yeah. Oh my gosh, for 20 plus years. And how long have you been teaching it? And I've been teaching it for, I, okay, Howard, this is hilarious. I just assumed every dentist had this conversation with insurances. I assumed every dentist would not be afraid that a Black Hawk helicopter would come over their business and, and men in black armored gear would fast rope down to the top of their roof and, and come in and arrest them for for providing value added service which is what so many people think that's that it's you can't do that rob you're under contract you are under contract but you also are are not uh, withheld from providing value added service well you, you, just, you said it earlier they're under a contract that they've never read yeah, thank you exactly so i assumed every dentist in in my whole state it's had like, had conversations like this you know, and so you know, Start teaching this until about 14 years ago, 12 to 14 years ago. I started teaching this just a couple years before Wes and I met. I start asking around to my colleagues because you know we all live in our little caves. We don't crawl out of them. We sit here in our offices as private practitioners, and we don't we don't talk to each other. And this is why I love what you're doing, so we can talk to each other, have these conversations. And and so when I found out that nobody knew about this stuff, wow, I started teaching and telling people about it. And then, it, you know, now it's starting to grow. I mean, to see Charles Blair actually write an article on it in January after I had the conversation with him five years ago makes my day because that guy's helped out a ton of people with, with CDT codes, but they're CDT codes that we don't utilize. I mean, D0350, oral facial image. I used to lecture for Dentrix on oral facial, uh, on digital imaging and radiography years ago before Dexas uh, got the ship there in the Henry Schein department. And I would teach oral facial imaging. And, and there's a code and a description and a fee with every insurance company. How come you're not charging for that, Doc? Well, I don't know. And I would say, you charge for x-rays, don't you? Yeah, all the time. Well, a picture speaks a thousand words more than an x-ray. And it proves the need for treatment. It, it's your legal basis why you do what you do. And talk about the educational purpose for the patient how come you're not doing that? So there's not just creating, we create codes. We create new codes that describe exactly what we're doing. And, and then we also, there's codes that docs aren't using. They're leaving money on the table, and we know they are. And so we, we help them out there too. So that, and, and, and here's the thing. Most offices, they lack the confidence to present treatment, needed treatment to a patient to charge for it because they, they're scared to sell. Well, I'm sorry, but we sell dentistry every day. Get over yourself. But the, here's, the other, here's the other dilemma, Howard. They don't believe they deserve to make money. They honestly don't believe they deserve to make money. And they're business owners. They, they, 
and, and I see that in the eyes and the minds and the hearts. They don't catch the vision. But as soon as an office catches that vision, Howard, as soon as they get it and they actually start implementing some of this stuff, then they take off, and it's like a whole okay, new Okay, okay, well, let, let's talk implementation. What exactly are you doing? Is this a one-on-one -on -one consultant? Are you like a, a PPO consultant, a dentist goes to your website, mypracticemybusiness.com, and they pay you to consult with theirs, or are you giving more just lectures to a room full of people and webinars, or how, how does your business model work put, disseminating this information? Well, so let me tell you how you, you tell them how yours works, and then I'll tell them how we work together. Okay. We go in and actually, again, there's so many places you can go out there. You can watch a webinar. You can go to a room someplace, but we know that implementation is the game. When I walk into a dental office, you know, and you look in the doctor's cabinet, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that's still shrink wrapped. On a Thursday and a Friday, I can sit in a room, get a bunch of great ideas, come home, and Monday, I have my email assault. I have a patient, you know, patient list, long as my arm, patients coming in, I've got cancellations and everything else. The front desk is running one direction, clinicals run in another direction, and we're trying to figure out how to get this implemented from what we learned on Friday. So in our approach, we actually sit down in the practice with the team, we help them impl implement, develop the codes, teach them the skills, we role play, we do everything necessary, because this takes a little time to implement because of that competence level that Rob talked about. Now they can come to everything that we do. We record, you know, when we're doing it in our in our sessions, we have our virtual academy so people can come on and actually learn this stuff online. But the best work that we ever do is sitting face to face, nose to nose with you, and going through the process and teaching you those skills. This way, there's nothing left out, and we force the practice to actually take time out of their schedule to learn this. The amount of money they spend on some quality training compared to what they get back in return on a strategy like this and this is just one of several that, that are trained but this one's very very profitable once they see that they can actually make money doing this their competence level goes up and some of the other things we train start getting you know some leverage in the, in the practice as well so again we do it face to face we have our virtual academy we do it online they all work but the best implementation is the one where i'm sitting there nose to nose or at least an environment like this virtually that it's live and we can spend a couple of quality hours together and make a difference. And by the way, I'm a big fan of you. You posted like 30 blogs on Dentaltown. And I'm a big fan of your blogs. It's good stuff. If you're listening to this. So, so I'm just, my, my job is to guesstimate what they're thinking. Thanks. So, so I, I'm, I'm thinking my homies are thinking, okay, this sounds really neat, but they're still a little confused of why, like, there's two people on this podcast today. I mean, are you guys connected somehow? I mean, one is Wes Jankowski with CEOdentist.com. And the other is Rob Thorpe with MyPracticeMyBusiness.com. How how are you guys? Uh, what? Or so, why, why are you guys together? Or, or so, how are you together? Because I teach I teach the clinical the clinical aspects of uh, dentistry and the business tying the business end into the clinical, and very few people do that or understand how to do that. And our company has the two softwares, My Dental Stats, My Dental Docs, that help solidify what a practice does and helps them make money and it promotes oral health care which is most important and then Wes teaches the business business side and so you know I've, I've done this for so many years and I've, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on consulting over the years and Wes is able to come in and help the team become ha catch the vision of becoming one and I come in and teach the team how to uh, understand the codes, understand what is they're missing, help them implement the softwares, and, and then West oversees the whole thing. So you're so like, so you're like, you guys work together, it's like Batman and Robin, you like to, uh, uh, two of you, two different approaches to the same uh, dentist client. And Wes looks more like Batman, and I'm, I'm because of the <laughs> Robin, going with Robin, so. So yeah. Rob, you actually do you know hard green leotards? <laughs> well, I'm not going to stand up in the this a podcast. They don't know that we can see each other, but I'm going to just keep some hands <laughs> <and> can't tell. <laughs> so you know, Howard, you know, it's you know, interesting. You know another you... great podcast to be though. I'm thinking about you. I mean, you know what what you're saying is is so you can sum it up in Utah. I mean, Gordon Christian will speak for eight hours about wear rates of composites, yet none of your fillings wear down. He'll talk for eight hours about bonding agents, but none of your fillings fall out. He'll talk about, you know, tin plating gold, so it'll have a tin oxide that'll bond to panavia 
and your crowns aren't falling off. I mean, he'll <laughs> lecture for 40 days and 40 nights about every problem you've never had. And then you go into the business side, which is looks like a tornado just kicked a hurricane in the butt. Mm -hmm. And 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 so and then that's the size of Rob Thorpe's um, audience versus Gordon Christian. I mean, Gordon Christian comes into town, a thousand people line up to learn about wear rates. And I just stand at the door saying, are your fillings wearing down? Is this really an issue? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going over everything he's gonna talk about. Show me on this list what your problems is. I think your problems are overhead, insurance, PPOs, staff, yeah. all this stuff. And they're like, Howard, Howard, did you hear that Healy Muller only wears 11 microns a year <laughs> and Tetrix Ceramics 14 <laughs> microns a year? And if you 10 play, you know, so, so I, and I'm a dentist too. I mean, I'd rather pull four wisdom teeth than golf. I'd rather pull four wisdom teeth than go elk hunting with my oldest son, Eric. I mean, I, I mean, I get it. They just, I mean, they're like chefs that own a restaurant. They just want to go back there and cook and they have no idea what their restaurant's doing. They have no idea what their business. So it's, it's a tough sell. They don't blink at buying technology or going to some, look at the TMJ courses out there. I mean, they're $4,000 a weekend, and they're all sold out three, four, five months in advance. And, uh, you know, and then you sit there and say, well, what was your return on equity last year? No idea. What's your return on assets? No idea. What, what is your profit margin on an MOD composite? A what? Um, what? What is your break-even point per day? What are you talking about? Do you have job descriptions? You know, I, mean, do you, I mean, you just ask them anything. And then, and then they want to know why corporate dentistry if you have 50 offices or more, those big boys now own 14% of the American dental market. And they, because dentists just want to learn about bonding agents. So, so how are you going to get your message out? And you said something in the beginning, which I agree that I wish consultants would get it. When a dentist are smart, I mean, they got A's in calculus and applied calculus physics, they ace that. Applied physics, chemistry, they ace that. Applied chemistry is biology, they ace that. Applied biology is dentistry. I mean, my homies are smart. They know that they can cook a steak or salmon. They're going to a restaurant and they want to see the menu that, you know, and, and these consultants, a lot of them are mysterious and this and that and are trying to close. I always tell consultants, they just want to know what's on the menu because if, if, if you're going to come in there and say, drop all your insurance and be a cosmetic boutique practice, and that man's looking in the mirror and saying, that ain't me. I mean, when I came to Phoenix, I came to Phoenix. People say, are you in Scottsdale, Paradise Valley? I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm country born in a barn, Kansas trash. I'm not going to do well in Beverly Hills or Scottsdale. I mean, you know, I, half the time I forget to put on my underwear when I go to work. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't own a watch. I don't use cologne. You know, I, I don't, uh, I, you know, so if the dentist just wants to see what you're going to do. So the more dentist, the more consultants will give away every secret they have then the dentist looks at the menu and says, yeah, I want to order that because, like you said, he just right. can't, she can't get it implemented. She can't right. get it done. There's not enough hours in the day. And, and the other thing that you guys have that's magical is the staff never listens to you because they know you're Kansas, born in a barn, trash, and, but a consultant showing up from 100 <laughs> miles away uh, with a tie on, and they just all sit down and take notes. So anybody oh, else... Yeah, I mean, so, so, they, the, so they're going to listen to you far more than they're going to listen to the hillbilly dentist, uh, you know, um, that they've been working with. Right. So what's really interesting is when I talk to the docs, I really connect with them quickly because we speak the same language. Wes can speak the team language, and that's where it's a symbiotic relationship between the two of us. And just like talking D0350, I'm sure there's going to be people in the podcast going to be asking their office managers, hey, are we charging for oral facial images? Because I just heard that we should be. And a third of the insurances I take, and I take 26, 27 PPO plans, and about nine of them pay for those, however many you take. They pay for them like x-rays. And, 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 cor and corporate has an advantage because if you have more than five or ten locations, those guys go back and negotiate higher fees. So you're, so you're competing. It's not a level playing fair. If they're paying the corporate office more money per fee than you, you're at a huge disadvantage. So th you, this is a way to kind of level the, the playing field between exactly. corporate and solo. Well, we're able to help solo practitioners, general practitioners, be able – and, and other – I we work with specialty practices too because – it's more broad spectrum in what we can teach a general practitioner, but the verticals that the specialists have also, there's 
there's uh, upgrading that they can do that they have no idea that they can do. And we help them understand that by offering the patient choice and differentiating those choices. But the interesting thing is it's like an extraction. I mean, how many patients out there just get teeth yanked time and time again, but are they ever offered bone augmentation for those extraction sites to preserve the jawbone? No. And so I see the practices that are out there, they're using an oral surgery socket preservation code, and they're using the extraction code, and then that's all they do. There's other codes that can be used, and other proce there's other procedural protocols that can be done to take a $275 surgical extraction, and by offering the patient choice, you can turn it into a $1,400 extraction that's not just making you money. No, forget about that. It's providing a service to the patient before it's an irreversible condition of not preserving the jawbone and doing it in a way that is absolutely fantastic to go in and place an implant or a prosthesis to sit on or anything else like that. That's just one of many clinical uh, 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 modalities that, that I teach. And then Wes comes behind okay, me. And okay, okay, sure but, but more, more specific for our homies. So, so they're, they're listening to you. The reason these shows are an hour long is because that's what the average commute is. And right. um, so we're 52 minutes into this, and she's sitting and saying, okay, so, so what do I do? Do, do I go to my practice, my business.com, and, you, and then my office manager sends you all of our PPOs, or do you come out to the office? And what, this is Dentistry Uncensored. What does this cost? Okay, you, so I'll, yeah, go, I'll take it. So we have a webinar coming up, and we have a website out there for CEOdentist.com, and I believe that Ryan has some information that uh, will go out with the podcast, but people can come in and we were going to, we're teaching a webinar on the 5th and 15th of September on this particular topic. It's all about empowering your patient choice and understanding how this upgrade strategy works. It's a free complimentary and, and that's thing. that's on the CEOdentist.com website? Yes, sir. So you would go to the date? On the 15th of September at 6 p.m. September 15th. 6 well, it's a good thing Mount it wasn't on 9-11. You know why? That's a, that's a very special day for me because that's my oldest son's birthday. He was going to turn 27. And it's the opening game for the Arizona Cardinals against the New England Patriots. And their little <laughs> criminal deflate gate quarterback won't be in the game. So we should win that one. <laughs> so, so it's four days after the opening season. So it's got to be a Friday night. Or, or no, uh, uh, Sunday. It's, it's Thursday. Thursday night. Okay, Thursday, Thursday. night. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so there's a registration site. You go to ceodentist.com slash patient choice. And Rob and I will be presenting that. That's, again, this strategy. It's patient, not a patient choice. Patient singular choice. So ceodentist.com forward slash patient choice. Okay. September 15th, yeah. at what time? And there's a registration at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard or? Mountain time. So that'd be what, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard time? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and how long is this webinar? It'd be about an hour and 15 minutes and Q&A at the end. Okay. The strategy is not that complicated. What we want to give is people the tools. They, if they, they will understand before the evening is over. They'll understand the upgrade strategy. They'll understand... Um, how to create additional codes for creating that value, and uh, again, the upgrade strategy. Uh, Rob and I will discuss uh, codes that are not being that are underutilized, like the DO three five zero. And from there, if people want our help to come in and help them, they can choose for that. Because, like I said, left to their own devices, they may not get implemented. So, how, we, so how we want to give it all away. How much does it cost to come in? Now, do you do you first like send? You, your company, all the PPOs, all the insurance plans, and you study it, then you come in? Or how, how's it working? What does it cost to come in? Because I want to go right to implementation. Perfect. Yeah. So you asked a question earlier about, um, you know, you start, you said that you're a guy from, from the wheat, for the wheat fields, from the corn fields. We don't teach a practice. We don't want to t change their style. We want to interview them. We can do it face-to-face. -face, we can do it online like this. We can do it over a phone call. We're interviewing to understand how, what kind of business they want to run. Or what kind of business they currently run? Business is one big math equation. You got costs, you got expenses, you got again. You talked about your PLs and financials and things. We want to take a look at those numbers, see how they want to practice, and then we cater or put this thing together so the doctor can win in this game. We teach them that. So with consultation, if they come to the webinar, the webinar is free. 
if we do a consultation on site, we'll come out there and put this whole thing together, including reviewing their uh, uh, PPOs and everything else to show them what can be done. Fourteen ninety-five, all psychological. It should have been fifteen hundred. And then if they fourteen ninety-five, and that, and how long is so? That's one day. You do all that in one day. We'll collect all the information necessary in one day. Then we'll come back and give them a business report that shows them exactly what we would do and how would we work with them. But I'm saying if we, for the fourteen ninety five, when you come out, is that for one day? I mean, you come out for one day, day, day and a half, two days, whatever it takes. Well, well yeah. how long does it take? And is, do you usually recommend shutting down the office, or is this something for the dentist? No, no. Actually, I want to. No, we want to come out in a day that you're running your business. We want to see how you run your business. We want to see your systems. We want to hear how you communicate with your patients currently, because all that makes a difference when we go down the path and treat you this teach you this strategy. And who comes out? One of you two, or or either either myself or Rob or somebody from our team. We've got a couple of the people that are qualified, but typically, like something like this, if someone came through this program and they wanted me to come out there or Rob, we'd work it out for one of us to be there. Okay, so the the typical office you go to, how many PPOs and indemnity insurance plans do they have? It could be wild like Brian, like uh, Rob's practice with 20, you know, 20 plus. We could walk into another one that's got three or four. The strategy works on both sides. It just happens to help a practice that's losing a lot of money in those reimbursements and those giveaways. So, but it works on both sides. The strategy still helps another practice, even fee for service, be more profitable. And, and, and Rob on said, this webinar, do you, is this, do you recommend that the dentist watches this webinar or do you recommend uh, the hygienist, the office manager, the, who should be watching this webinar? I'd like to see the whole teams come to the, to the conversation because they're all going to be involved. I can't have my dentist actually presenting treatment and these upgrades in the back and then the front desk being undoing it because they don't understand or they've got phobias around insurance. They think patients won't take on the, uh, the treatment because this, you know, it's not covered. They're postponing treatment until next year because they're, you know, they're going to renew and all that kind of garbage. So it's, you got to get them all together. Um, and again, we record everything so they can go back, watch this again, Re repetition. Let me, let, me, let me just make some thoughts on this uh, as I'm a 53-year-old grandpa what? with a four-year-old granddaughter. You know, Ray Kroc is dead. He's underground six feet and 40,000 yep. McDonald's are getting up every day and crushing it. Uh, Sam Walton of Walmart yep. is dead and it took him and his wife Helen 20 years to open 18 stores and now they're opening 40 stores a month because they're dead. The most successful, I mean, every time I, I go to a dental seminar, the right half of the room is all individual dentists coming to save money and they make a X. And on the other side of the room, every row is the complete staff at the dentist, the receptionist, the wife, the kids, the, the whole crew's there. And those dentists make twice as much and the richest dentist don't even go to the course. You, you'll see like three rows of some office with like 25 employees. And I'll say, where's your dentist? They go, oh, he's golfing in Pebble Beach. So, so, so the smartest dentist wouldn't even watch this webinar. Their whole staff would. And then if you want to make less money, you could watch it with your staff. And if you want to just go broke, just watch it all by yourself. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a team business. And dentists are always saving money by not educating their staff. And they always say things, well, what if I put a bunch of money into training my assistant and then she quits after a year? And I said, well, what if you don't train her and she stays for 10 years? You know, that, that would be... <laughs> That'd be far worse. I think this is really, really cool. And I'm going to have my office. Send me, send me an email. And I'll reply to you guys with uh, my whole team. And I, I, think this is, I think this is the biggest issue in dentistry. Again, the biggest issue I think in dentistry is the whole industry has this mindset of this dental office that was built in the 70s and the 80s with fee-for-service, cash, indemnity. And they just love that high-end, high-tech stuff but the fees have come down 40% and they're still giving their staff raises. And these two lines are not merging. And that's why dentist net income is dropping $3,800 a year. And they're down to 174. And my question is, what, what, what's going to get your attention when you find out you're making less than 150? I mean, is it going to take, you have to go underneath a hundred? Do you have to sit there and realize, wow, I went to eight years of college and I made 99,000 and my brother, who's a plumber made 102,000. I mean, you know, I, I mean, so uh, I, I don't know what it's going to take. Uh, and by the way, you know, um, um, Rob, could you do me a favor? Dick Barnes was in this yeah. house, in this very house. God, 
30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. He actually, one time after a seminar, he came over and bought a rice pressure cooker for me because I've always been fat. And he's like, Howard, you're eating crap. And he bought a pressure rice cooker and taught me how to eat healthy. I, I love Dick Barnes. But, you know, he's got that. He, he's been in this industry for decades, three or four decades, maybe five. I don't even know. But do, do you still talk to him? Um, I I still I talk to his son from time to time. I, I I wanna, talk- tell him I want to podcast his dad because he has a amazing historical perspective. Because my question I want to ask him is, what is the impact of um, cat uh, dentists like you and me who have Cirac CAD CAM? What is the impact on his amazing Arrowhead Dental Lab? Where where's Arrowhead Dental? It's south of Salt Lake? Is it South Jordan, Utah? It's in Sandy, Utah, just Sandy. on the east east southeast corner of the valley yeah and uh, i would love to hear what his amazing mac record thoughts are i mean if, if he thought you know you know and, and his predictions like you know where was it 30 years ago i mean remember 30 years ago it was all pfms oh yeah and now pfms are basically extinct and then it's they all are. porcelain then it's milk. I, I i would i would give anything he is so damn cool he's so damn smart he's a dentist and he owns arrowhead dental laboratories what's the website of that is it just arrowheadlabs.com or yeah, I believe it is, but you know it's interesting because Dick Barnes was actually one of my mentors. Same here. And, and he was he was one of the guys that that first taught upgrading, and and it was amazing because he would just tell the dentist or part of his uh, following he'd say, "Stop using codes, descriptions, and fees. Just tell the patient is this case is going to be four thousand seven hundred sixty-two dollars and ninety-five cents." And then he said, "If you take a PPO plan, just." figure out what the PPO would pay, and then the additional, just put it under the 9999 code. And that, it's like, but what do we call it, Dick? I don't know. Call it whatever you want to call it. I don't care. And so he, and, and, and his, his son, he's a great, he's a great kid. He's, 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 dad has taught him well, and he's doing, he's doing well. But the problem is, is patients are more savvy with technology. Patients with social, all the, you know, with Google and everything else out there, Man, when you give them a document out of our document center, and you say, I'm going to put in IPSC Max, and I'm going to use a, a, a E4D machine to do it. They'll go home and Google that stuff. The majority, the large majority of patients will go home and Google, um, you know, PhilTech Supreme, or they'll Google a BioHorizon or a Noble BioCare implant. And then what do they see when they do? They, they read all that stuff. Wow, this is good stuff. My dentist is putting good stuff in my mouth. Versus the average consumer, they have no idea what goes in their mouths. Right. No idea. And, and so I owe Dick Barnes a, a bunch of credit. Um, Troy. Troy's his son's name. Troy. Goodness great. Hey, you know, it's still working up here. And what time. are we called? I, I went and saw Dick in 1987. And what, you know, everybody on Dental Town, they call themselves townies. They just came up with that themselves. And everybody yeah. that left Dick Barnes course, they'd tell their dentist, I've been Barnesified. And uh, <laughs> they would say, Really? And they go, Yeah, you better go see Dick Barnes to get Barnesified. Do you remember hearing that back in the day? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a, you know, it's just, it's amazing as I sit back and I look in Utah here with, uh, with, uh, Ultradent products sitting out there Dan and, Fisher. and Dan Fisher, I, I, he, I got a hole in my, one of my teeth that he put in there as we were testing, uh, whitening agents back in the, back in the late eighties. And, and it's just what a great company they are. We got CR down in Utah County. We got, you know, Arrowhead, we've got all kinds of CR mean, cl- um, Clinical research? Right, which I still call Yeah, I know. Still... I think that was the crazy thing. It reminds me of the Coke and the new Coke. I mean, you know, they when they came out with new Coke, they realized it was a mistake. Gordon and Rella still don't realize that everybody in the industry calls it CRA, except still. for those two. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why they changed it. Jeez. But, you know, it's, it's been fun. I've, we've been really blessed here to have, you know, this kind of uh, technology around us and these thought leaders throughout the country. You're down in Arizona, and it just, we're, we've been fortunate, you know? Actually, it's really not Arizona. It's really southern Utah because almost, I would say, seriously, I'm not even kidding, one out of every four dentist friends of mine in Phoenix has family in Utah or was born in Utah. It's at least one in four. That's I'm, funny. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we'll be going into a Gabers and every single person on the row was either born in Utah or his sister lives there. Uh, but, oh, yeah. uh, well, you know, I, I want to help you. I want to help you get the word out because I always feel sorry uh, for anyone in dentistry on the business side of the equation because 
dentists just want to learn TMJ. I mean, I mean, they'll go take a full mouth rehab course, and this doctor's going to all these full mouth rehabs, and I will stand up and lecture. I've done this for 30 years. Said, by the way, okay, it's August 12th. How many of you have not done one single full mouth rehab case this year? And all the hands go up. And it's like, then I call uh, Arrowhead Labs. All the labs say 96 out of 100 crowns come in one at a time. And then you go to a veneer course, and it's standing room only at the AECD. And I'll say, how many of you have not done one veneer course in the last two years? And all the hands come out. I'm like, then why are you here? I mean, you just chase unicorns. They just, they just, their, their ideal patient is the tooth fairy riding a unicorn, and they're going to do full mouth veneers and a full mouth rehab. But, if, but what I'd rather them do, if 96 out of 100 crowns are done one at a time, if they could raise their margin on that, I'd rather, exactly. them, I'd rather them make a $20 bill or, a, or another Benjamin every time they do something that they're doing all day long. Are you making money on a cleaning exam x-ray, on a single unit crown, on an FMX? I don't want to hear about sinus lifts and veneers and full mouth rehabs because, dude, that's, those are fantasies that you dream about, okay? There's 211,000 dentists in the United States alive with the dental degree, and it's August. And I would say out of that 211, 180,000 of them didn't do a single full mouth rehab or veneer case in the first eight months of 2016. Rob, do you agree or disagree? I 100% agree, and that's why our thought leadership of what Wes and I do, and what our, pro what our products at my practice, my business are built around, is need-based dentistry. And I have Dan Fisher to think, you know, to put that, drill that in my head all these years. <laughs> need-based yeah, dentistry. That's where, and if we can help practices increase revenues with need-based dentistry, our statistical dashboard shows the top 10 procedures. And I never understood why, Howard. Why do we need to look at our top 10 procedures? What are they? It's, that's what our strengths are. What are, your, that's, what are the top 10 procedures? For me personally? Oh, 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 I thought you meant it for dentistry. I didn't mean you oh, personally. Well, yeah, I mean dentistry. If you, if you understand your top 10 procedures, if you have a statistical dashboard that shows you right at an instant what your top 10 procedures are, and you and and That's you what you do also, right? Yeah, you focus on those areas that make you the most money. Stop trying to do full mouth cases or exactly what you just said. You and I are on the same page, like crazy on that. That's what we teach. We teach, we teach you how to better yourselves with what you already do. We don't come in and teach new fangled approaches to things or, or new business philosophies that are way out there. We teach basic business principles that everybody should know. And you got an article that you're working on with Tom Giacobbe, how to take dental insurance the profitable and ethical way. Yes, sir. And yep. who's, that, who's that by, Wesley or Rob? Wes. Wes wrote that? Yeah. And when is that going to be out in dental town? As soon as uh, uh, Dr. Jacoby takes a look at it and says it's good to go. He actually helped us. I submitted back a couple of months ago. He said, Wes, this is fabulous. Would love to do it but I need you to make some uh, tweaks to it. So we've just sent it back in to see if we can't get it posted because we think it's a hot topic. Most people don't realize this, but uh, Dental Town Magazine um, is all Tom Giacobbe since 2000 to 2016. And when we started that magazine, everybody told us we couldn't because dental economics was known by Penwell and they had like 80 magazines for 100 years. And Dentistry Day had been out 100 years or 75 years and all this stuff. And we started out and everybody thought we were a joke. And now that magazine is, uh, I think it's the largest circulation, uh, one, of, one of the most read, most circulation. Um, Hell, the digital circulation alone is, is, is mind-blowing. And uh, so kudos to Tom Giacobbe. But congratulations of getting, uh, getting it past us because I got a copy of it. I mean, he gets about two feet of material a month and whittles it down to 50 I pages. Know. So uh, kudos to you. So, uh, um, so any, anything I can do to help you get the message out, uh, you might want to talk to Howard Goldstein. He's the one who does dentaltown.com. You might want to put an online CE course there for a, a lunch and learn for the whole office. Uh, I'm Howard at dentaltown.com. <laughs> so he was the second Howard. So he's Howard Goldstein. So he's Hogo, H-O-G-O at dentaltown.com. But, um, I think you ought to, um, uh, package a, uh, a lunch and learn for the whole staff. And go over all this with the whole staff because the staff because and here's what you got you're driving into work and and you're gotta you're gonna cough up a blood clot because you know your hygienist 
wants to see this afternoon. You know she's going to want to ask for a raise because, you know, she just uh, looked at her chart and she's a Virgo and the earth has gone around the sun again <laughs> and that's all the logic, you know, they need for another raise. And you need to start being transparent with your numbers and sitting there saying, hey, you want more money? Yeah, so I, I want to give you more money, but we have to make more money. And let's get a breaking point number. And Rob, one deal, when you said your uh, production cost per hour, is that for the whole office or is that separate than the hygienist? When you no, said, that's, for the, that's the entire office. Okay, the whole and, office. You just have an office. So you like an office hour number, total office uh, cost per hour? Exactly. Okay. That's what we have. And then, and then that, that would be the best. The second best would just be a break-even point for the day. Like, what do we have to do today just to break even? And that's why I went to MBA school, because my dad taught me all business skills. But he went to Mass every single morning. All of us had to go to Mass with Mom and Dad every morning our entire life. But he cussed like a sailor. He called it the bare-ass minimum. He called it his BAM number. And yep. He'd go to a cook. What's our BAM number? And the cook would say, what? What's our bare-ass minimum? What do we have to do today just to pay the bills? And everybody knew their – but I started thinking in 1998, maybe these economical terms really don't all have profanity in them, and I'm going to go back and get my MBA. And basically the only thing the MBA taught me was to say all the terms without cussing. But, yeah, I, I think what you're doing is amazing, and I'm sorry that a dentist won't blink. At buying a hundred thousand dollar Lanaf, a hundred thousand dollar CBCT, a hundred thousand dollar X-ray machine, and then you try to sit there and get them to have a dental consultant and learn the business and go over their fees, and they just think uh, it's unnecessary, and then they uh, they they fiddle away. So we are still out of time. We're like twenty minutes over, but hey, uh, thank you for all you do, uh, both of you guys. By the way, um, Rob, have you ever driven to um, where I live in Phoenix from Salt Lake? No, I've flown down there many times oh my god don't ever fly down here again that is the most amazing drive i mean you leave phoenix and then you go up to flagstaff and then you go around the grand corn grand canyon on either side then you're going up through all those canyons in utah and bryce and i mean and the, the luckiest drive you'll ever do in your entire life is those 10 percent of uh the snowbirds in phoenix are from canada and they're all up at, what was it, Winnipeg, straight above? I think it's 1,100 miles straight north of Phoenix is Winnipeg. And everybody will tell you that they thought they were going to drive down there and say, yeah, we were going to try to make it in like two days, drive like two 12-hour days back to back. And then they always end up taking 10 days because they have to stop every couple hours and see something really cool. All the seniors down here now, I mean, that, that is absolutely the coolest 1,000-mile drive on earth from Phoenix to Winnipeg. Nothing have anywhere tops that wow okay i'll tell i'll take you up on driving down there you tell me when i can drive down there and i'll teach your team everything i know give well, me a well, half a day. Send, send me an email and uh, both of you send me an email and i'll reply back to my team and i would uh, i would i would love that and uh, and we got to work more for dental time because i just want my homies to be happy and healthy and they That's think that every time they go out and learn some clinical thing that they're going to be happy and healthy. And usually what they do is they, they learn, they spend a bunch of money learning something that they hardly ever do. And I want them to make money all day long on the things they're doing all day long, cleanings, fillings, exams, x-rays, single crowns, make money on that. And then the rest, I just classify as boys and their toys. Like I have a CAD CAM machine. I have a CBCT, just like boys have boats and jet skis and, 50 pound compound bows. I mean, they're, they're, they're toys, but the dentists think I'll buy that toy and that'll fix my business. And no, you get your business fixed. You get your house in order. Then you make so much money, you buy these toys in cash, but they don't have uh, the cash. They're leasing these toys over four, five, six, seven years because they're broke. And they think that toy is going to come in and get their house in order. And it's not. And you can't get the house in order unless you get the whole team involved. And you got to be transparent with all this stuff, but they're prying their ego. They don't want the, the staff to find out that they're making more money than the assistant. I mean, it's just, you know, crazy stuff. And, uh, okay, I'm rambling. Thank you so much <laughs> for being on my show. And if you're, if you're watching this and you're really, you know, and you're uh, the low, if, if you're smart, you'll watch the webinar. If you're twice as smart, you and your team will watch the webinar. If you're a genius, you'll watch the NFL football game while your whole staff watches this, and then you'll, you'll already order them to come down and implement this stuff before they even watch the webinar. <laughs> all right, buddy. Thank you Howard, for all you do. Thanks, Howard. Howard.
score me Dick Barnes. I so want to. I so want to meet. Uh, see him again. Hey, I. I'll call him. Every he's never not returned my call tell, yet. Tell him I've done um, all the other Utah legends. I've done Gordon Christian on this show twice. I've done Dan Fisher on this show. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, Utah legends, but he's he's the Utah legend I want to get on my show. It would be fun. It would be amazing, actually. I so I have. I used to own a dental lab, and a couple of his technicians uh, that were my technicians. They left him, came work for me, and then I sold out and uh, sold my lab off, and then they ended up going back to work for him a couple years later. And uh, so I, I get a good, I have a good feel for how his business do, is doing. And it's been a very interesting dynamic over the last several years. So well, I think that would be a good podcast for well, you Well, when have. I got out of dental school, America had 15,000 dental labs. Now they're at 7,500. So, I mean, imagine so, if half the dental offices would have gone under. And I mean, it's a crazy industry. And tell him also that, um, like we did, he he could come on with Troy if he wants to do that, uh, if he if he wants uh, two people on or whatever. But uh, it'd be good. Troy needs his name needs to get out there because uh, you know it's just Dick Barnes's name's the only one out there. And yeah, and you know why? You know why it's so hard to get him on my show? Why? Who has the largest boat in uh, uh, what, what's the lake for Hoover Dam? Is it Lake Mead? You know yeah. who has the largest boat on Lake Mead? Who? Dick Barnes. You? Oh, he. <laughs> have you seen his boat? Have you seen his? He's got one up in Seattle. That's a it'll it'll cruise the the globe. Oh my he's God! I when, when I went to when I went to uh, uh, first time I ever went to Arrowhead Lab in uh, Utah. Um, um, he says, "Come here, I want to show you something in my basement." I mean, I I, I I thought it was a joke. I mean, it was like the largest boat I'd ever seen in my life. And I said, "Where the hell do you even? Where can you even take that?" And he goes, "Hoover Dam, Lake Mead," and I I don't <laughs> think any other lake you, you could even launch it. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.